Hello, football family. Welcome into Huddle It Up Films Draft Talk. Got my guy here, one of Chris, one of the OGs, one of the people that really helped me out when I started uh, the channel, talking about all kinds of things Ravens. But uh, had to bring you on this time of year. So glad you could join me because you're a draft guy like me, and we can go into a deeper dive, talk about some of these under the radar prospects. And so, thank you so much for joining me. Chris no actually called me from the ball court the other day uh, up in New York. And uh, to set this show up, so I appreciate that. Wanted oh, to ask yeah. you about your game. Uh, like, are, are we more uh, Angel Reese or Kate, Caitlin Clark up there, Chris? What do you look like? Uh, I, don't, I don't watch either, though. I don't watch basketball, so I don't know. Um, all I know is I get buckets. That's all I know. That's that's good. I, I don't know much about them either, but I think, you know, hot names I've been seeing. So, uh, I, I mean, I know a little bit. Angel Reese is from Baltimore, but so you're not wearing the little leg thing, the leg sleeve, right? Nah, nah, no, no leg sleeve. Um, just straight up, straight up shorts, and uh, you know, just going out there getting buckets, making people look dumb. That's what I like to hear. So down here in Baltimore, um, you know, I was the skinny kid on the courts, and things got rough. Like you can't call foul, you call for ball, they look at you funny and then start making fun of you. What's the games up there like in New York? Uh, yeah, it's the same way. It's, it's the Thunderdome. You know, you come in here and. You, you call you call one of them weak fouls, you're gonna get kicked off the court. So, you know, you got it's the court I grew up playing in. So, you know, it's it's like home for me. So, so everything's good over there. Yeah, nice. Yeah, Chris got reputation. You know it. So, Chris, deep cover podcast. See it on your handle. You also join coach. What is it like twice a week for uh, Ravens roundup? Is it roundup round table something like that? Tell us, tell us about it. Uh, yeah, every Monday I'm on the Ravens Roundup uh, with Coach Evans, um, Lunch Break Hot Take, Rogue Pod, and my man OTR Mike. Uh, we're on there every Monday uh, doing our thing, talking about, you know, the Ravens, NFL, other little shenanigans sometimes. And, uh, you know, I've been with Coach. Uh, we've been for the last few weeks, we've been doing um, like a positional rundown. Uh, where he picks five guys, I pick five guys from a certain position, and we go through it. So the last one we did was the edge defender. So, you know, you could check that out on Sip to Tally. And then next week, we're going to be wrapping that up and doing, um, what do you call it, uh, DBs. So he he we actually just exchanged our five and five. So I got his five, he got my five, and we're going to talk about some DBs. So I hope Cooper DeGene makes your list because I've seen you tweeting about him. Are you on there? Uh, he's not on my list, but he's on coach's list. Okay. As long as he's on there somewhere. And I was actually, uh, in on the edge chat. So if you guys check that out and pull up the chat, you can see my comments on the, uh, on the guys they were talking about. So Chris, let's get into it. Some under the radar prospects and everybody's been talking about, uh, the big guys, but before we get to that, there are two prospects that are projected to go around the first round and a tweet of yours the other day. Uh, I'm not going to bring the tweet up because, uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit controversial for the, uh, the old YouTube. But basically, the point was great. You got Graham Barton out of Duke. You got Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. Uh, Graham Barton, some people are saying, look, he's too small. He's not strong enough to stick at tackle. This guy's going to have to play center. And then you have a lot of people, the same people, who look at Jordan Morgan and say, man, this guy's a tackle all day. Their measurements are the same, Chris. Uh when I looked at their tape, almost the exact same thing. Two of the best left tackle tapes in the class, I think, consistent. And then when I watched Barton versus Florida State, Jared versus those guys, he did struggle a little bit with power. And then when I watched Jordan Morgan against Washington State, I believe it was, he did struggle a little bit with length and power. So I have the same kind of uh, like grade on them. I had a hard time putting them on my board. I think both go in the first round. Uh, what are your thoughts on the two of them? Or did you see them as similar as me? Um, yeah, I, I have them ranked pretty much in the same spot, same location. Um, I think they do a lot of the same things well. Um, but what I, I have Barton ahead of him. Um, just speaking purely as a tackle, I have Barton ahead of him because um, I like Barton's ability to recover way more than I do Jordan Morgan. Um, not to say that Jordan Morgan can't do it, because he can, but I would feel more comfortable with with uh, Grant Barton's ability to recover. And for me, that's one of the things I look for the most when it comes to tackle play or just O line play in general. Because you're going to lose. You know, it doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to lose. So how do you recover from that? That's what separates 
the good left tackles from the great left tackles are the ones that can be able to, you know, just recover, be able to deal with that secondary move that a, a advanced edge rusher is going to going to be throwing at them. So I like Grant Barton's ability to to do that more than I do Jordan Morgan. But I, I like both guys, like you said. Yeah, I, you know, that's a great point because you are going to get beat. I mean, I can't really say it any better than 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 you did. Uh, these NFL edges get paid too. You're, you're going to pass protect 35, 40 times a game sometimes. And uh, the other guy's going to get you. So we, we saw it with Ben Powers. His ability to recover really helped him. And, you know, he wasn't the quickest guy off the snap, but he could hang when he was beat and not get called for a penalty. Whereas like John Simpson struggled with that kind of thing at left guard and racked up the penalties. So, yes, I believe in both of them. Um, I'm not sure if either of them can – can stick a tackle, but I would give him a try there. I, I think that, like, Jordan Morgan, to me, um, just to speak him up, talk him up a little bit, his ability to anchor, I think, is is just impressive, man. Like, his body control, and he doesn't play like an undersized player against some of these bigger guys. I think it's more like the counter moves and length that you're talking about where he would get crossed up at, this, at the top of the rush and, uh, and, and get beat that way. But I think both are excellent prospects. Now, if you were, if the Ravens were sitting there, um, two part question: Would you be willing to draft them at thirty? And if you did draft them at thirty, do you think they could stick at left or right tackle, or do you think their career is going to be uh, better, like as a dominant left guard, say? Um, so if so, at thirty, I I do the the pick first. If uh, Grant Barton or Jordan Morgan's there at thirty, uh, I feel more comfortable with Grant Barton. Um, I, I think he's like to me, he'd be a no-brainer pick. Uh, it just, in my opinion, I, I think he's a guy that you know you could kick him on the inside. Um, you could leave him out at tackle, whether that be right or left tackle. Um, I think he has the feet to really do it. Uh, you know, we see some, we we've seen some uh, success with another undersized guy and Patrick McCarry, and I think they win in similar ways. You know, Patrick McCarry, he's not doesn't have the arm length, you know, the desired arm length that people like, but his ability to match and mirror and be able to just stay in phase with, with edge rushers. I, I think Grant Barton does the same thing well, but I, I think it's in a, a better package, so to speak, because he's a, he's bigger than him. He's a better athlete than him because his pro day, he tested off the charts and that's coming off of surgery. So, you know, they, we're talking about a, a really, really good athlete. And then also, you know, he played center in, in his freshman year. And a lot of people are projecting that's where he'll play in, in the pros. And that's fine. You know, I, I think he could hang in on the inside, too. But um, I, I would definitely give him the chance to see what he could do on the outside. I love it. So I have Barton all the way up at number 20 on my board, predicted first round. Of course, that's not counting the quarterbacks. So you, you take out, you know, add the quarterbacks in there. Maybe he's 24, 25th. Uh, in mind. So, I, I mean, I really like him. Morgan just a few spots uh, below him at 26. And I think what separates it for me is uh, like his ability to play inside. I think Barton transitions better. If he if he had to play guard for the Ravens, I think he, he could handle that. Whereas Morgan, I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. And Morgan just seems like more of a pure tackle to me. Right. Whereas Barton seems like a guy that you can move around. The McCary uh, comparison, to, uh, that's one that I, I had actually – thought of myself and brought up i would say like a better version of patrick mccary if i was uh, as a prospect if i were to describe graham barton just excellent athlete and chris i mean faltano i think maybe has the best left tackle tape in this class but other than him it's these two guys for me where where did you uh where do you fall on that uh just overall uh, the yeah whole left class? tackles like the whole class left tackles like who's tape? Like if you were just say judging the college player and not projecting them to the pros, I would say Troy Fatano was the best left tackle tape I saw, and then Barton and Morgan right behind that. Is there anybody else you want to throw in there? Or? Uh, definitely Joe Alt. Um, I like Joe Alt a lot. Um, I like J.C. Latham a lot. And um, who's the other one? Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, um, yeah, Troy Troy Fatano. Or Fatano, yeah. however the hell you say that. Fatano, Fatano. I just know. Look, you you emphasize the ton. That's mm. what I got from the combine. You say ton, uh -huh. so yeah. as long as you get the ton in there, I think you're fine. But I appreciate that. So let's get to some of these more under the radar prospects, Chris. I'm just going to throw it to you. 
let's throw a name out there and uh, let's talk about him, man. Who, who do you like? Who are you looking at? Who's not getting enough love maybe in this draft? Uh, for me, it's uh, Dylan Lobby, uh, you know, running back. Uh, he's really, really fun to watch. And he's he caught my eye down at the um, the senior ball. Uh, he's somebody that, you know, I was like, damn, who the hell is this white dude just keep making plays? And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, small white dude, stocky. So he's going to get those Danny Woodhead comparisons. And he was getting them during the whole time at, at down at the senior ball. But it's like, all right, is it lazy or is it true? Because then when you watch him, you're like, damn, it's kind of true. Like He kind of plays just like Danny Woodhead. And, and you pop the tape and you watch some New Hampshire tape and you see it all over. Um, he would, for me, like just looking at it with the Ravens lens, he's exactly what they need to complement what they have with Derrick Henry because he would walk in and be the best receiving option the Ravens have at running back immediately. Like he's not just, oh, he can catch the ball out the backfield. Like this dude can run routes like a wide receiver. And that's impressive of him. But also the part that's impressive is not just what he does as a receiver, but as a running back, I think he's wildly underrated as a running back because you look at the vision, you look at the marriage between his eyes and his feet. And it's like it's simultaneous. He sees something and his feet are moving immediately. And he has that that short area quickness to make people miss in tight quarters. You know, and, you know, I, I know in the highlights, like, say, DeAndre Swift, for example, if DeAndre Swift is one on one with somebody, DeAndre Swift is probably going to make those dudes look silly. But in tight quarters, DeAndre Swift doesn't have the ability to really make dudes miss in those tight quarters consistently. And to me, that's the difference between college and the NFL. And we haven't really seen DeAndre Swift take that that leap. We see little flashes, but we haven't seen him take that leap. Now, with a guy like Dylan Lobby and, and another dude like Blake Corum, those dudes have that vision, that short area burst and vision. And they're able to kind of make nothing out of something and squeak out every single yard that the defense will give them. And we saw that with uh, Devontae Freeman. It was an older Devontae Freeman, but the vision was impeccable. And I think that's what you see with these two guys, with Blake Corum and, and Dylan Lobby. Yeah, they're not, you know, these spectacular, you know, uh, athletes like a, like a Jalen Wright or anything like that. But they're able to pick up the necessary yards that you need and, you know, also provide that that uh, passing game, that attack in the passing game, too. So. There were two guys that I really, really enjoyed watching. And and although he's a little bit undersized, you know, he's not an easy guy to tackle either. Like, he, you don't just put a finger on him and he goes down. Like, no, he, I mean, he's he's 5'10", 206. So, yeah, he's he's short. But yeah. when, when you're under six foot, I look for that 200 number. You know, that yeah. tells me a little bit about your build, how hard you can be to tackle. Um, and really, for running backs, Chris, short, being short is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing get lost among all those trees and, and things like that. So I think the, the play strength is definitely there for lobby. Also think it's interesting, Chris, I want to build on this first. We're looking for the same thing in a Ravens draft, uh, you and I, and that's somebody that can catch the ball out the backfield, somebody that can be in there. If we have the ball uh, in the two minute drill, or if we're behind where they're taking Derrick Henry out of the game, Derrick Henry is going to get his catches, I believe in the system when the game is close and, and all that, but hey, end of the half, no timeouts, minute and a half left. We're taking it from the 25. We're in pass mode all the time. We're not trying to wear Derrick Henry out in this situation. It's week five or something. We need a guy who can come in here. Dylan Lobby, 68 receptions. Uh, he also had a return touchdown on his stat sheet. Didn't see it, but he returned, uh, returned like, apparently kicks or punts. But like you said, Chris, these receptions aren't just these like little swing passes and checkdowns. This guy's out there doing it McCaffrey style or, uh, you know, other backs that we had seen uh, way back in the day. LT used to do stuff like this. His ball tracking, Chris, unbelievable. Like a, like a wide receiver. You, know, you can throw this man a back shoulder fade mm -hmm. and he'll track it down and he'll finish that play. Um, even though he's a stocky, you know, 5'10 kind of guy. So I do like Lobby. I thought um, good point on his vision is his, his eyes are tied together to his feet. You can see him playing games with the linebacker. Uh, playing possum in the hole and then finding his, you know, his being patient enough 
Uh, and he played, he played a good amount of ball. Uh, like he was their main guy. So here's my, here's my, uh, negative notes. Okay. Uh, I was not impressed. Like, I remember I watched the Albany game is the first time I took this notes. And I thought that he looked above average in many areas. This is my initial notes. So I, you know, I've since have grown from that. Uh, look, looks above average in many areas versus a competition, but is not a standout athlete even among them. Now it's four, five, four, 40 is a good time. Like that's an NFL running back time. If you run a four, five, four, that's okay. But I, I expected him to be a little bit better athlete, bigger, stronger, faster when he's playing on that level. Do you have any concerns that once he gets to the NFL, some of that speed that he shows dries up, some of that strength, and guys get, get square him up, and he's not getting that uh, those yardage in the short areas that you're talking about? Um, I don't – I mean, early on, yeah, but I think once you once he gets acclimated to it, I, I think he can – I think he can have a, a similar role to what you saw uh, from – What's the dude from the Chargers? Little ball dude. Um, Austin Eckler. Okay. I think, I think he can be along that same line where he's, you know, brought in as that third down change of pace guy and then eventually just grow into a role, you know, where he can be more than just that receiving threat. Um, not to say he's going to be Austin Eckler, but I think what you want, that's what you want, that, that arc. You want to bring him along in that kind of way where you don't put too much on his plate. You let him grow gradually and then put more and more on his plate as his game hopefully continues to grow. Love it. And, you know, just for Ravens fans who may not be aware or not thinking about this, Justice Hill is under contract, but just for this year, he has been the Ravens' third down back. And I think, like, Justice Hill's effort and his eyes and pass protection is generally good. But as we saw in that Chiefs game, uh, sometimes he gets a little physically overwhelmed, whereas Lobby's a, a stronger player for sure. And Lobby also strikes me as the kind of guy, Chris, that you could put on special teams, which is crucial. If you're going to be a backup running back, you're not Derrick Henry, you're not Keaton Mitchell when both of those guys are back. To get yourself active, you've and you've got to play, be able to contribute on special teams. I think he can handle that part of it. Yeah, I mean, he has uh, return ability too when it comes to punt returns and kickoff returns. So that and with the the new rules, you know, that's going to increase somebody like him his value because. If you're able to provide a spark in that sense, and now that it seems like returns are actually going to be part of the game now, uh, I think that's another you know, little check mark that you could put next to his name. So I got him at number 12 on my running back board. Uh, I think that's a pretty solid, you know, I, I got him right behind guys that are really talented, touted like Braylon Allen, uh, Audric Estime, and I like the other small school kid, Isaiah Davis. I think he's kind of the same kind of player, just not quite the receiver Lobby is. Lobby's an excellent um receiver but uh but yeah he's on the board um if i move him anywhere chris i'm gonna move him up uh can't see him sliding down the board where would you be open to the ravens taking a running back uh in this draft or where would you think lobby would be where would we have to pick him to uh to get him um i'm gonna guess like fifth round maybe i think that that's a good little little sweet spot for him uh the fifth round because I'm I'm not sure one will go in the second, so you got to think the run is really going to start third, fourth round, and I think once those guys get you know get taken, I think that's when you'll see you know the, the those later later round guys, and and I think the the fifth round should be the the sweet spot for him. One more question on the running backs: You brought up Blake Corum, uh, fun player to watch. I wonder if he's my my big question with him, I have him at number five. So obviously I'm giving him a lot of love. I, I think that he's he deserves to be up there amongst the top running backs. My question is he looks like a power scheme only back to me. Like I don't know if he can run this outside zone and anything off tackle. Um you wanna you wanna go to bat against me on that or do you kind of see him the same way? Yeah, I see I see him as diverse. I mean I, I think you know he has the skills to to thrive in multiple schemes in my opinion. Uh it's just Michigan, you don't really get a chance to show off, you know, your chops. I mean, we've seen a little bit of his receiving skills, uh, especially in that that Alabama game. He was wide open, but you know, we saw those skills. Um, but at, at Michigan, you, you're not going to really get a chance to to really show off because we know what they're going to do. They're going to line it up and they're going to run right down, you know, right down the defense's throat. So, um, but I, I do like Blake Corum quite a bit. Uh, just same kind of things as, as far as the vision. 
being able to pick up those tough yards and to watch him do it against, you know, defenses like Alabama and, you know, going up against that Michigan defense in practice, he did it multiple years. So uh, it's just about him being able to stay healthy and, and just pro- show more uh, of that, those receiving chops that he wasn't able to show at, at Michigan. Did you rank them? Did you rank the running backs and where did you rank Corum if you, if you did? No, I didn't rank. I the only the only um, position group that I ranked was the tackles. I haven't ranked anybody else yet. All right, so Any I got group? I got Jalen Wright um, as my number one, which is kind of a dark horse. Uh, I mean, he's explosive, but everybody's got Jonathan Brooks number one. Jonathan Brooks coming off that injury, so I, I kind of slid him down. And then my my star position player is Marshawn Lloyd. I've been going to back bat for him since before he started moving up the rankings after his testing. Man, I just I love Marshawn Lloyd's. Uh, if they ran a, a mesh point a lot, and I love his ability to catch the ball off uh, off schedule. Caleb Williams running around, Marshawn Lloyd catching his eyes. I have Brooks at three, Benson at four, and Quorum at five. So that's how, that's how I line them up right now, man. Okay. Okay, so, hey, who else? That's uh, Dylan Lobby is a great, great choice for this show. Who else do you have, Chris? Who else should we talk about here is under the radar type prospects? Uh, Javon Baker. Uh, out of uh, University of Central Florida, a uh, wide receiver. Uh, he's somebody that I don't I don't understand why he isn't spoken about more. Uh, you know, you watch him run routes, and he's a, a route running savant. You know, there, there are things that he does as a route runner that there are guys in the league who haven't even flashed being able to 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 run routes the way that he does, and you know that that's a huge compliment to him. Because to be able to do that in college, uh, in an offense that isn't really, you know, high powered like you see across the country, I was pleasantly surprised with, with his game when I actually finally got to to watch him because it, it was it was super super impressive of him and you know you see him make these acrobatic catches and it's just it's ridiculous catch after ridiculous catch with this dude. Um, I, I think he's not. He's not going to blow you away with his um, athletic skills as far as, you know, the 40 time, his height, his weight, you know, any of that kind of stuff. He's average at best. But it's the nuance in his game within his route running. Like you see him kind of toying with with uh, cornerbacks. And for somebody to have that kind of confidence as a college player, you want to see that grow. And you you want to be able to cultivate that and and put that in an offense where he's not the main guy because at, at UCF he was the main guy he was the focal point but now if he's a number two number three now he's doing that against you know your, your slot guys and and to me that's exciting I, I don't think he'll ever be a number one but I think he could be a damn good number two eventually if he hits you know his ceiling I love it I love it so a lot of times Chris man this is why we love the draft you know, the scouting reports that we have on both of the guys, well, you can do this, you can't do that, you know, does this really well, hasn't shown this, are mostly the same, but it's like weighing those things and how they translate is the art in it and making lists. So, you know, my notes are very similar to yours. Like I, I wrote down A-plus body control. Uh, but he's downfield. You're talking about the highlight catches. He is just uh, – I think his savant, his, ma- his major league uh, ability is to track the ball and to somehow contort his body, he's got decent play strength too. He's a, he's over two hundred pounds himself, six foot one, two hundred two, uh, long arms, thirty two and a quarter. That don't hurt when you're trying to catch the ball and sky over people downfield. Uh, but yeah, he's he was a tougher evaluation for me because he was consistently underthrown. So it looked like like I was really betting on this combine. I couldn't tell if he was a little bit slow footed or if it was the quarterback thing or what. He ended up running a, a four five four, which isn't the end all be all. It's just a, a track event; doesn't t- play speed. But um, I think that that's about about right. Like he's a a low four fives guy, play speed to me. But I did have the trouble um, trouble judging that. I think if we differ on anything, I thought that his route running was very good. I thought um, he's a, he can uses his leverage and his play strength when he's setting up these guys. Like he'll get you lean in and then break it off. But I think he has a lot of cleaning up to do in his route running. And I think that should be seen as a positive. Like when you get him in the NFL coaching room and that kind of thing, where he could actually be a lot better at route running. I think he's 
I think he's just relies on his natural ability to like uh, set guys up and not really get quick in and out of his break. So uh, I would like to see him, if he can, get a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, work on his body and work on his route running. And I agree with you. I think he could be a, a number two, three type option in an offense. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, fit is going to be big, you know, with any any player. Uh, but with a guy like him, you don't want him to go to a place like New England. And, you know, right. you, want, you want him to go to a place that has some established vets already where he can sit behind and, you know, not have to walk in and be a team's number two right away. He could be a number three, a number four and come along slowly and not not have too much put on your plate. Because when you have too much put on your plate and you're not ready for that, you have your Quentin Johnsons of the world. And, and I don't think he'll be asked to do that because he's not going to go in the first couple of rounds, probably. You know, he, maybe he's a, a sneak, you know, sneaks into the second round or third round and surprises people. Um, but he's probably going to be a third, fourth round type guy, you know, not Quentin Johnson drafted in the first round and what all these expectations. So hopefully you're right. Hopefully, you know, he goes to a place where, or hopefully I'm right. Hopefully he goes to a place where he's not asked what all those expectations. Yep. Yeah. So I like him. I have Javon Baker right behind Malik Washington in my board. Uh, you know, guys that I'd be targeting third, fourth round, um, depending on how the Ravens attack the receiver position, whether they get one early, whether they address the O-line and corner and all that other stuff, the safeties that we need. Chris, we only got two safeties on the roster. You know, I realized that when I was doing the show with Ken. We got two, bro. We know, Worley ain't back. It's it's Kyle and Marcus. So we're going to have to add a, a safety in this draft for sure. But um, when if we do add a mid-round receiver, Baker is a guy I was looking at. What'd you think about uh, our guy, little Malik Washington? Though he's not getting a lot of love either, and uh, I see a ball player with him, man. And I love myself some ball players. It's just like my own personal bias. I got to kind of quell that when I draft it because, you know, being an undersized guy myself, I'm always looking for ball ballers, and I don't care about size and speed. But then I realize that size and speed are very important too. So I'm evaluating, I got to put that bias, that little man bias, I, uh, aside. But man, do I love. Malik Washington out of Virginia. Yeah, man, Malik Washington. He he's a fun, really, really fun. And and you know, you watch him on tape, and you kind of think he's bigger than he is. You know, I, I didn't think he was that small. Like I, not to say that I thought he was like six two or anything like that, but I'm thinking this dude is like five eleven. And then right. when you you look him up, like five eight and a half, and you're like, damn, one ninety one though. Like yeah, five, so you know, he's short. You're, you're, he's not small. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I I think this dude, he's just – he's the well, he's the only player on Virginia. So defenses come into the game having to – knowing that, all right, we got to stop this guy. And they weren't able to. I think there was only one game where he didn't have 100 receiving yards last year. Right, and he had 110 catches, 14-26, nine touchdowns, and he was the guy, and, and everybody knew he was getting the ball. Yep, and, and that reminded me so much of Zay Flowers, where he was at BC, and he's the guy that you have to stop, but you still can't stop him. And it was the same way, and you saw him win downfield. You saw him win in, in the short game. You saw him win in the intermediate game. Now, how does that translate to the NFL? You know, I think in the NFL, he can be a guy that, you know, you put him in the slot. You can have him work some of those gadget plays. But I think he could provide and, and grow into so much more than just that. Um, I, I don't think he, he's someone that you want to just pigeonhole and be like, all right, you're the gadget guy, and that's it. You know, you don't want to you don't want to Devin Duvernay him. You know, right. you want you want to see him grow because I he I think he he can turn into a phenomenal receiver in the league, in my opinion. At the same time, I think he you know it's funny it's straight out my notes. He's he's good enough to be a team's gadget guy right away. I think. Like yeah. if a team drafted him and just wanted to break him in, he could do he could do that. Um, that's that's what I like about him. I think the Ravens could use somebody to take that role because I don't like to see Zay pigeonholed into that role at all. Like I don't I don't want to see Zay in motion. I want to see Zay exploding off the line of scrimmage and being able to threaten downfield as much as possible. Break off those intermediate routes, Chris. We saw Lamar and Zay connect, you know, on this sideline little sideline. Uh, hitch routes man out routes to to the boundary like i want to see zay more dangerous i don't want to wear him out 
taking all this punishment, trying to get us five yards underneath. So if we do add somebody, like say you got Malik Washington and Zay, people will be like, well, they're, they're a little similar. Nah, they're not really. Uh, you know, they could both run the gadget, please. Um, just to read my notes on Malik Washington, uh, he ran a 447, so he's got a little speed to him, too. This, I mean, this isn't a slower guy. Uh, little man with big game immediately becomes most team's gadget guys and can earn himself a job as a full-time slot. Production is off the charts. Charts. I think his calling card is Yak. Uh, he's just got that premier balance, quick feet, and a great feel for the game. I think he defies his height uh, and makes some plays, like tough, tough catches, uh, catch radius for for a short guy. I thought were really good. His hands look smooth. He has a feel for this position, spatial awareness, and he can fi finish touch ca tough catches. So if you're asking him, you know, with his height, he's probably going to work the middle a lot. He's got the body type. Can he catch through contact? Uh, really a big fan of Malik Washington Washington's game. Yeah, he he's like a uh, his game is kind of like um, a Anquan Bolden if he had like a piano fall on his head because he's way smaller than Anquan Bolden. So that's, to me, that's what it, it kind of reminded me of, like a little mini Anquan Bolden. The piano on the head, like the old school cartoons, like yeah. Tom and Jerry or something. Squish Anquan Bolden down to 5'8", and you get Malik Washington. Uh -huh. Yeah, Malik's got some juice, though, bro. Like his, I would say Bolden, I didn't see him, like, you know, with the jukes and stuff like that to make people miss. Like, I wouldn't consider Anquan Bolden a gadget guy. I think... I think Malik's got that in him, like the. Well, the remember Malachi. early early on, Bolden was a, a gadget dude. You know, he he was one of those guys coming out of FSU that because he was a quarterback. And, Young uh, Bolden, yeah. He he was like they didn't know how to use him, you know, and he was a guy that was like, all right, let's just get the ball in his hands and let him make his ma work his magic. It's true because his rookie year at the Cardinals, I think he was rookie of the year. He caught like over 100 catches or something ridiculous. I think he had the record. And right, and a lot of them were like little slants and drags. I'm talking about the make you miss ability, though. I would take Malik. I would take Malik. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we could differ on that one, but but yeah. So Chris, uh, two fourth round picks. We got a third round pick. You'd be cool with with uh, with taking them taking them somewhere in that range. Um, definitely for Baker, I would. Um, Malik Washington. As much as I love him. I'm not sure if that that's the way to go. Okay. You know, even though I do love him a lot, um, you said you know, not to compare him and Zay, but that's a you're building a really small wide receiver room. With it's those. true. Um, not to say like if he got drafted, I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, you know, good wide receiver, you know, somebody that I like. But and and I'm not one of those dudes that's like, oh, you got to have your wide receiver room be a basketball team. I think that's like an old way of thinking i don't i don't believe in that at all um but i don't think your wide receiver room should you know look like friday night tykes either lamar might disagree bro lamar likes these little guys little smaller guys i don't know but uh but yeah i i'm kind of like for the first receiver we add i'm kind of looking for for size myself if i yeah you know, everybody's got different like if lad mcconkey's there or whatever he's not the biggest guy People compare him to, to Zay. I kind of see some Jerry Judy in Lab McConkey's game uh, with hands, though. Uh, just the ability to shake. But, like, I, I don't have a preference. Overall, I'd like just, like, the best receiver possible. But if I could have my cake and eat it, too, I would say, like, a bigger guy. What, do you, what are you looking for, like, if you have one quality or two qualities in the, in the first receiver we take in this draft, what would it be? Uh, separators. Horizontal separators. separators. Um, that doesn't mean vertical, just – being able to win, uh, win quickly, and, and be able to provide that quick separation that Lamar likes because he likes to throw to wide receivers that are open. You know, tight ends, he'll throw it up to tight ends. You know, it doesn't matter if they got somebody draped on them. But for wide receivers, for whatever reason, he just, he's not comfortable with that. He'd rather see the guy open and then throw the ball. So um, it, one of those kind of like a Ricky Pearsall type. Uh, one of those guys, like even a Troy Franklin, to go go down just a little bit more. Uh, I, I think those guys are, are more uh, horizontal separators that that would fit with Lamar's play style. Yeah, see, I'm scared of Franklin. That's not I'm not a Franklin guy. I still give him his proper ranking and do. It's not like I dropped him way down the board. But I worry about Franklin, man. 
some of that combine and stuff like that, he just looked really uncomfortable. And I, somebody jumped on me before in the comments for saying this, but I'm, I'm telling you, like it, it just, it just rubbed me. To, it made me pause because he, he didn't look natural with his hands, feet, and coordination. Um, hey, also, Chris, I've had this comment before. Um, I'm high on AD Mitchell because of that route running, that timing. I, like to me, there's not a lot that you can't can pick on with AD Mitchell. Um, he gets the separation. He is a crafty bully. Gets open on time. I've heard people say, like to counter the counter your point to be like, oh well, we can't draft route runners because Lamar and Bateman. Bateman's a route runner, and Lamar doesn't like route runners and this and that. And I just think that that's way off the mark because we. What are you going to tell me that we we don't draft somebody who gets separation because it doesn't fit with our quarterback? Like, who are we supposed to draft? The guys that can't get separation, like. You have to trust your quarterback. It might just be a chemistry thing. They got to call plays for Bateman. They got to make him the first read and not just be on that strong side looking at Zay and Mark and all that. But uh, what would you say to somebody to say, I don't want a receiver because uh, he separates too quickly and that's not Lamar's style? Um, I know. I think that is Lamar's style. He wants guys who can separate quick, uh, be able to get that that easy separation. Uh, I think that's what he he's gravitates towards. What I don't think he likes are wide receivers where he has to throw it up the guys who don't get separation and um who don't get consistent separation um and i kind of think uh i i, I kind of put ad mitchell in that bucket too um i think it's more you have to it's more about trust with ad mitchell and really throw, okay. throwing it up to him um i i saw you know there's some routes like um in the alabama game where i think he gets number nine on on a on a stop and go um but as far as like refined route running against the nfl caliber db i didn't really see much of that on on three. really okay yeah. see that's that's a big like break between us because that's that's the reason i have him so high on my board i i see it a like, crafty bully is how i describe him uh yeah, like, he'll, I, I he'll use he his need, arm i think he would need like a josh allen type quarterback who okay will give you that it, where it doesn't matter if you're if you're covered you know um with lamar we haven't really seen that you know in in his six years he's been here um we haven't really seen him be able to you know develop that kind of chemistry with somebody outside the numbers now is that because he doesn't have the guys talented enough to do that maybe i don't know i don't have the the answer to that but i'm just going by what we've seen so far and and the type of wide receivers that he's been able to mesh with pretty quickly and and it's been those type of horizontal separators all right so comment below guys ad mitchell and his route running what do you what do you think do you, you side more with chris or do you side more with me on that uh that's one difference in our scouting report so i love that chris we finally sent, found something that uh we kind of disagree on so i love that all right so malik washington dylan lobby uh javon baker what about some – do you have any more of the underrated or should we go to, like, the real, real sleepers right now? Uh, let's go to the real sleepers. All right, let's do it. So get Chris defensive. gave me – Chris gave me – yeah, let's get defensive. Chris gave me some homework, and I appreciated this. Uh, he told me he wanted to talk about Kenny Logan, safety out of Kansas. And I've, I've only gotten the one game, but I wanted to watch him versus Texas because I figured, you know, the receivers on Texas and – and the tight end, uh, Jatavia Sanders on Texas. I wanted to watch him in that game. So I had some positive notes and negative notes. What are your overall thoughts, though, on Kenny Logan, the safety out of Kansas? Uh, so when I when I say I like him, I don't want people to think uh, he's like a third rounder for me or anything like this. is a later round guy. You know, I, I think safety is a need. And I think if there's a good one there in like the third, fourth round, yeah, you jump on it but i don't think it's a need that trumps other needs you know i think it's a little bit lower on the board not, not to say that it's not important but i think kenny logan is a guy you could get in the later rounds if they choose to go that route who can wear a bunch of different hats for you in in your your secondary and i think that's what they want they don't want somebody that's just a free safety they don't want somebody that's just a strong safety they want somebody who's shown that they can be multiple and he's done that you know in his last four years at, at Kansas, he's led the team in tackles. Um, he's played free safety. He's played down in the box. He's played some in the slot. Um, he shows really good instincts. And 
you know, he's a guy that's always around the ball. You know, like you see, he's always going to fill up the stat sheet. He's always going to be around the ball, you know, whether it's a, a tip pass, whether it's a fumble or causing the fumble. Like he's always around the ball. And, and I think smart defenders like that, those are the kind of guys that the Ravens gravitate towards. They want dudes who, you know, use their 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 instincts, are able to play smart and, and not reckless. Now, he's not the best athlete in the world. He's not going to have any attributes that, that wow you when it comes to athleticism. Um, and I think that over-aggressive nature can sometimes get him in trouble as far as, like, ducking his head when he's tackling and things like that. And, you know, uh, obviously – you don't want that, but to me, those things are, are few and far between where he's not always doing that. You know, more times than not, he's using his fundamentals. He's wrapping up. He's tackling, getting the guy to the ground. But um, as far as being like, you know, a super athlete or anything like that, I think that's why you'll see him go lower than um, lower than what are some of the other uh, safeties are expected to go. And I mean, Chris, with the, you know, I have to 100 percent back you up here and just say these there, there are plenty of strong safeties in every draft for that reason. Like they're just really good football players. So they, they're not athletic enough to stick out a corner, but they have good eyes. They're tough. They play strength. They're the, the good old like coaches kid type of, uh, you know, uh, feel to them, to their game. Like a Chuck Clark, for, for instance, you know, sixth round pick uh, and Kenny Logan, you know, from what I've seen could be one of those guys too. I thought, uh, when I watched the game, they had him in the post a lot. I didn't like him at the free safety position. He, obviously, like his body type looks more like a strong safety. You could see his play strength. He stuck Jonathan Brooks uh, in one of these plays. He was being blocked and fought his way through the block and took on Jonathan Brooks, who was, you know, all, obviously already at the second level and stopped him pretty well. Like, you know, he took, he had to take a little bit of the bullet for the team, which is strong safeties have to do that, Chris. You, you can't always be flashy and, make those Patrick queen type tackles where you're chasing somebody down. Sometimes you got to take the bullet for the team. And uh, I like that about Kenny Logan. I noticed though uh, one play, did you see his, his eyes deceive him? I know you mentioned him being over aggressive. Quinn Ewers actually scored a touchdown on him uh, where he was in, in the post, followed one of the receivers and lost sight enough for their quarterback to scramble in for a touchdown. And uh, Ewers doesn't like, he's not a robot or, or, uh, you know, a statue, but he's also not real, real fast. So I, I didn't like that Kenny Logan wasn't even in the screen on that. Like he, it, he was following the receiver so much and so locked on that that he didn't see it. So that's kind of why I feel like if you put him in strong safety, let him keep his eye on the butt bunches, get him closer to the line of scrimmage, he might be more effective. Is is that what you saw on the, uh, the tape that you saw? Yeah, I think you know, I like I said, I, I think he's a guy who could be multiple. You know, you don't want him in just one spot. You want him to be, I, if I had to choose, I definitely would want him around the ball uh, more than on the back end of the defense. But I think just like we saw with Chuck Clark, like there were times where Chuck would have to line up at the back end of the defense. But, just, you know, like Chuck Clark too, you know, I think he's best around the line of scrimmage. I like it because, I mean, you're right. The the Ravens love to disguise, at least with Mike McDonald. I'm I'm hoping and I'm thinking that's going to be the same with Zach Orr. Show you one thing, do another. So they don't like to be predictable with where their players line up. So I agree with you. You have to have a guy that, all right, yeah, he's the strong safety, but a handful of times a game we can have him in the post by, back there and he's not going to hurt us. So I agree with that. I would like to see them draft one person who's just, no matter what they – no matter how good you project them or how well you project them as a free safety, who can just come in and be a dominant, strong safety type uh, to allow Kyle to be Kyle. So, you know, when Millette's in there, Kyle's at strong safety. When Kyle's at, at the slot, you bring in this drafted pick who's played a lot of ball um, and can handle his own and be an enforcer on the strong side, cover some tight ends, cover some deep half, uh, things like that. So, I mean, the Ravens only have two safeties on the roster, Chris. we got Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams. We're probably going to have to draft or at least bring in an undrafted free agent. Probably going to have to come up with two young players here. And uh, maybe they bring Daryl Worley back or veteran strong safety. But, uh, but, yeah, especially with Marcus is, you know, having trouble staying healthy. I, I feel like we need to invest in safety. To me, like I'm, I'm higher on getting the safety. If it was in the third or fourth round and a guy like Jaden Hicks is out there, 
or Javon Bullard or one of my top safeties is there, I wouldn't be upset if we like passed on corner, got our safety first, and then took advantage of this deep corner group and took our corner after that. So, yeah, we, what do you feel on like the overall state of the safeties for the Ravens? Yeah, I, th I think they need one, and you pick up a good point with uh, Marcus Williams' uh, injury history the last couple of seasons. Uh, you know, that's something that you can't overlook. Uh, we know he's talented, but uh, obviously the the injury history is there. And you could say the same for our Darius Washington, who kind of splits time, sometimes safety, sometimes slot. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, a cause for concern and a, a need right now. But I think, you know, those back end guys that they need, uh, there's so many safeties still, still out there right now. And uh, I think, you know, it, obviously you got the draft coming up. Um, but I, I think those are holes that you can, probably fill in easier than you know offensive tackle a uh, guard you know um outside corner you know uh edge rushers so i, I think those are, are spots where it, it'll be a little bit easier to to fill in than than those other premier positions well absolutely absolutely like you have to be a certain body type to play tackle you have to be a certain body type to play corner. Mention this on Ken's show. Uh, if you're about six one to six three and weigh two hundred and thirty pounds, you are a, a draft. Uh, you're a linebacker in this draft. Like it's amazing how specialized these guys are. When I was typing in the heights and weights for all these guys, I'm like, all right, yeah, let me guess. Six two two thirty two. That's going to be right, like right around where all of them are. Um, but for safeties, they're they're just good ball players, bro. They they they. they you know, they're not corners, obviously. They're not the athletes of the corners, but they're just excellent ball players. And I think that the you mentioned the, uh, there's a lot of good strong safeties out there still unsigned. I think that's a credit to this draft where people think, look, we can get a younger guy, get him under control for four years, let him play special teams, let him play on in this particular package and break him in instead of uh, paying a veteran or a retread or somebody that's got some, some, uh, some, some wear and tear on him. So, so yeah, I appreciate that. So, Jarius Monroe, Chris, never watched the game on him. You brought him up before the show. Who is this guy? Where did he play school? Could he be drafted? Tell me a little bit about Mr. Monroe. So uh, Jarius Monroe, he's a guy who I've been wanting to get tape on, and and um, I was able to finally get my hands on some uh -oh. uh, all 22. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for him. He's, he's a guy that I've had my eye on because I, I watched him. Uh, I think it was USC. They – well, he's from Tulane, first of all, from Tulane. So if you know about Tulane, you know that they've been building up their program and, you know, they upset uh, USC in the bowl game last year. So um, he's actually came, uh, he came on my radar last year. I was like, oh, I got to keep an eye on that dude. And, you know, came in this season, had another good year, you know, led the team in, in uh, interceptions for the second straight season uh you know former nickel state and you know whenever i hear nickel state i get the warm and fuzzies for my man ladarius webb uh because I, I was a huge ladarius webb fan and, and that's where he went uh so he was at nickel state for a little bit then transferred uh for Tulane. he's been there for the last two seasons um i was really really looking forward to his pro day um after a couple days they finally releases his combine numbers i mean his pro day numbers they weren't good. I'll leave it at that. Um, I think he ran close to what, like a high or mid four six, and at cornerback, it's not going to fly. You know, is is and you can see that on tape. Uh, he's it, he's a guy that his play style kind of resembles um, a little bit in, uh, Josh uh, Josh Norman. Okay, kind of like you want him to be a, a zone cornerback where he can just sit back have some depth in his route and play the quarterback's eyes and be able to click and close that that's where he makes his money, his click and close ability. Uh, he's has really good ball production. Uh, I think he was the shrine bowl MVP to uh, this season. And, you know, he, he's incredibly instinctive and just like with Kenny Logan jr. You know, I, I like instinctive players. I like smart players. I like physical players and, you know, Jarius Monroe, he's all of that smart, physical, instinctive uh you know had seven career interceptions 51 career passes defended um but i think he's a guy who you probably would either move to the slot or cornerback 
Great. Yeah, I'm looking at his I'm looking at a scouting report, uh, you know, Lance Airline scouting report here. Six foot two oh four. So he seems like he's stocky enough, big enough to where he could transition to safety or slot. Well, um, you know, if he's just long speed is his uh is his weakness. But he says strengths, body type can be classified as big, long, and strong. Finished college with 46 pass breakups and seven interceptions over five seasons. So he's an older player. Uh, builds downfield wall with size slash length that is hard to throw over. Good high-low balance from underneath in uh, two deep zone. And he's an above average tackler with strength to stop the carry. Weaknesses has trouble matching press release. He allows early separation. Too up light, too upright and straight-legged when covering in space. Transition, step slow, lack speed. Uh, he needs to trust his technique better. So it sounds like a very instinctive football player that just might be, uh, you know, not enough, not enough athletic enough as far as speed and quickness to play corner. Let him play in zone. Let him come up, smack people, and make plays. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I I think this dude, he, he's a fun little little project uh, that a team can have. I don't know if he'll be uh six seven even you know priority free agent but you know i i think this dude has has something there where where you can you can mold him into a, a really nice contributor very nice i'm gonna try to find what i can on him then uh go i love this this is what i love is like i'm getting homework assignments some other guys uh you know asking people who do you like and that kind of thing so it's that time of year for the draft so chris what do you got going on? Uh, do you have plans on draft night? Anything that you want to promote, plug? Who are you going to be with, Coach or uh, MC and Carrie? What's going on? Uh, with all three of them, um, it's going to be me, Coach Carrie, um, everybody on the Ravens Roundup. Uh, that's a uh, lunch break hot wow. um, big crew. OTR Mike and um, don't forget uh, about Endo. Endo. Yeah, yeah, don't Endo. forget about Endo. That's my guy too. I like to Endo try to get under his skin. The Rogue Pod. Uh, so, you know, we did it last year. It was a lot of fun. Uh, coach was like, all right, we got to do it again. Round two. So we're going to do it again uh, for the for the first night of the draft. And I think think the second night, I think the second night. So we'll be doing that over at Sip to Tally. Uh, so that that should be fun. And then we got some uh, episodes of Deep Cover coming this this week. Well, next week. So when is the bracket show? Uh, where you where you go to bat for your guys, and will my guy AD Mitchell be in the bracket? Um, AD Mitchell will be in the bracket. Um, so what we're gonna do first, we're gonna do our seven round mock draft, um, where we go through the mock live and we talk through the picks. So mm -hmm. we're gonna be doing that this Sunday. Uh, that's me, Mike, and Kerry on the Deep Cover Pod, and then uh, later on. Later on next week, we're going to be doing the bracket show. Okay. So, so that's that's my favorite show. I've, I've said it on Twitter and stuff. My favorite show that you guys do every year. They, they, if you haven't seen it, guys, they come really, really close or nail the picks. What is it? You nailed the last two picks, and then last year, Zay Flowers was a finalist in that show. What Do I, I got that right? I think we did. I think we got like – I think we were like three or three um three for three and then last year um wasn't it joey porter versus flowers yeah so it was joey like... porter versus zay and uh, i think so we got to blame coach for that coach coach def he'll tell you he takes the l for that um but uh he picked joey porter because he he said he thought that's what the team would do but i believe he wanted zay so okay. we, we kind of give him a little you know uh, a little pass there because he wanted Zay, but he thought the team would take uh, Joey Porter. But, hey, uh, man, and both of them played really well. Porter yeah, was a so. finalist for Rookie of the Year. I got a lot of flack for having both of those guys high on my board last year. I think I had Porter like ninth or 10th and Flowers mm -hmm. at 12th. So, like, I love both of them. Um, yeah, this great show. Uh, Chris, you know, welcome to join uh, me day two if you guys aren't getting together. Uh, just to let everybody know. We'll be here. We're going live uh, at nine o'clock day one draft coverage. And then we're covering all of day two. I will have uh debonair death pants while we'll be here. You got his partner, Nikhil Mehta, uh, Voss and Yuri from the Ravens way. We'll also have Jordan and Gabe from the Ravens situation room. Uh, and they'll be in and out. I'll have at least a few guys with me the whole time. So we'll keep it fresh, keep it fun. And uh, yeah, dude, if you're not doing anything on day two, 
please uh, let me know. Stop by for at least a half hour, something like that. And then we, uh, we talk about these day two picks because uh, cool. can't yeah, wait, man. Lineup. It's that time. It's a good lineup. Uh, a lot of friends in that in that lineup. And and shout out to my man, Dev. Dev is, well, he used to live close to me, but, uh, you know, he, he, he left me. So shout out yeah. to Dev. Uptown girl, Dev. Yeah, nah, Dev is, is in the burbs now. So shout out to Dev. All right. Yeah, shout out to Dev. I uh, love those guys. Can't wait. So, Chris, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate you. No doubt. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Just want to say, you know, thanks to my football family. I love my football family. We'll have some more episodes coming up soon. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Chris, say goodnight to the people, please. Peace, people. Thank you for watching.